y'all doing? Uh, please be seated. Um, <laughs> I'm really grateful uh, to Seminary of Southwest uh, for opening this opportunity to speak. This is my first ever commencement address. Uh, so, you have to bear with me. I'm a poet, which means we tend to go long. Um, I was raised in a Pentecostal church, so if you know anything about fundamentalists, we tend to go long. Uh, so I said to myself, it's, it's been about 26 years since I stood in a pulpit. Uh, when I was a young person, I thought I was going to be a minister, and I thought I had the call. And so I was doing sermons at 16 and 17. Then I went to college and found poetry. <laughs> Here we are now. Uh, but um, I want to thank you again for having me, for opening your doors. I came to Seminary Southwest to back in September to give a poetry reading. And it's the first time again that I've ever given a poetry reading at a seminary. So I didn't quite know what to expect, what could be said, what couldn't be said. Uh, but it seemed everything I said was all right because they invited me back. <laughs> um, and so I will say there, there will be a bit of, um, how do we say, they might call it in certain spaces, call and response. Is that all right with y'all? Y'all are used to that, right? I see that y'all like to sing sort of in, in that sort of lining out style. So we're going to practice a little bit before we begin. All right? So first, you should greet your neighbor. Whoever your neighbor is, greet your neighbor. Say, hello, neighbor. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So we feel comfortable. We feel comfortable talking to each other, right? Because there's going to be portions of the, the, this preaching that I'm going to give where you have to turn to your neighbor and say something to your neighbor. Y'all all right with that? All right. Um, when I was asked to do this commencement speech, the first thing that came to mind was something my mother used to say to me when I was sort of moving into what might be something that I couldn't see the end of or it might be difficult. And so I started thinking about this thing my mother used to say to me, and I'm getting to here. And, I, and what I realized was it was sending me back to... Uh, the Apostle Paul, right, in the letters to the church of Corinthians, right, the Corinth, and then to Galatians, and I was like, oh, Paul keeps coming up. So I said, oh, as a poet, I'm always looking for the right form. What is the form of the address, right? Sometimes it's a sonnet. Ooh, I love you, but you might not love me back, right? <laughs> um, sometimes it's the elegy. It's grief that sends us into writing. And so what I decided was to, since I was sort of moving through Galatians quite a bit and through Corinthians, I said, well, let me do this as a, a letter, right, to the graduates, right? So, you know, I didn't write this in Greek. Um, <laughs> it's in what we might call demotic English. Uh, dear graduates, I greet you in the spirit of Apostle Paul Grace be unto you in peace. Forgive me. I've always wanted to say that, right? Like, who hasn't wanted to say, like, I come with grace, you know, like, in peace. Like, it's very rare that we get to say, I come in peace. <laughs> Growing up with a Sunday school teacher as a mother in a Pentecostal church, I spent quite a bit of time reading the King James Version of the Bible, reading the letters of Paul to the church at Corinth, watching my mother pour over the letters with concordances and biblical dictionaries and all manner of books surrounding her in preparation for the weekend's lesson. There in my grandmother's attic, I watched my mother sit in her bed with a heap of text, a notepad, several pens, highlighters of varying hues in her lap, all in the name of trying to unearth something both on the surface and deeply submerged in the text. Often she would tell me of the various characters and personalities in those onion skin pages. Boaz, Ruth, Queen Esther, Job, John the Baptist, and of course, Paul. Paul was fascinating to me. A man, of God, a man who God knocked from his donkey, his ass, <laughs> and then spoke to him through the donkey's mouth. And aside, you know, I loved that the word ass was sanctioned in that moment as a child. <laughs> 
I would run around the house and yell, I'm the preacher of the Baptist, and I'm the ass bringing the word of God. <laughs> In spite of my youthful churlishness, the moment was so profound to me that I would look at my grandmother's poodle expectantly, waiting for it to talk. <laughs> In fact, I went through the world for many years waiting for God to speak th to me through various farm animals I had encountered regularly. I lived in southern New Jersey, there's a lot of farm animals. As they said in the church I grew up in, God works in mysterious ways. I was ready to encounter the mysteriousness of God. I was ready for God's awe and wonder, ready for his potential gifts, the strength of Samson, the wisdom of Solomon. What I did not know then but know now is that my mother was the gift, was God's mysteriousness lighting the path providing a lamp unto my feet and the future. I became a poet, I became a professor. My mother was my first example of a scholar, of what it means to be enthralled with a text because it might provide some wisdom, some insight in how to move forward in this dark life. If I were Pablo Neruda, I might say that she was sitting at the well of darkness and casting her bucket down, trying to resurrect what bits of life she could. And she was teaching me that it was worth, a worthy endeavor, an endeavor that one might devote one's life to, the pursuit and wrangling with darkness. Fighting and looking at the light, as well as finding the truth in darkness. Dear graduates, it is from there that I greet you, from looking down into the darkness of the future. I greet you with your years of study, with the many books you've poured over. And maybe you too have sat on a bed like my mother, or sat in a library, or in the car puzzling through, sitting with a piece of literature, with some hermeneutic interpretation that bedeviled you. I greet you from those depths, from those light and dark moments, from confusion. I greet you because today is graduation day. And it is a day of celebration, and we are doing that, and we'll continue to do that, because we have to take celebration with us, even into those dark moments. However, it is also a day of remembrance, a day of thanks, a day that is both an exit and an entrance. It is obvious what the exit is. Life as a student, a seminarian at Seminary of the Southwest. However, what is it that you're entering? Yes, you might be entering a post as a chaplain at a hospital or at a school, or you might be entering into a job as a clinician, local clinic, working with community or struggling with mental health, or maybe you've decided to continue your education, decided to go on to another degree. But even as we are entering these vocations, we are staring into a glass darkly. I don't seem to be able to escape Corinthians, but I assure you, I will eventually. <laughs> In the Pentecostal church I grew up in, the deacons and mothers of the church would often utter this phrase when testifying about some difficulty or uncertainty they might be facing. They say, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And they shut their eyes and raise their hand above their heads and shake it. Rarely would they finish the verse. I never knew why. But it seemed as soon as they stepped into the portion of the verse that said, but then face to face, whatever burden, confusion, or conundrum faced them, they had, it had somehow lifted. It wasn't until I was an adult that I ever knew what the end of the verse actually said. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Now I understand why they closed their eyes, raised their hand, and shook it in the heavens above their head. They understood that one day they would come face to face, not with confusion only, but with clarity. That speaking this scripture into the difficulty acted as a type of medicine, a reaching beyond the break or tear in the rope. They were linguistically salving the wound. They were speaking the future they wanted to see into being. The novelist and nonfiction writer Toni Morrison called it saying the unsayable. There in the middle of disaster, in the middle of struggle, they were speaking its end, its resolution.
They were creating a doorway out of suffering. So I say to you today, as you're entering into post-student life, that you might be entering a darkened room. You too might be looking through a glass darkly in terms of one's future. Moving into the ministry, maybe moving to a new city, a new town, moving into a counseling position in a strange state, a place where you might not know anyone. You might not be able to find an apartment or the apartment you do find is not as advertised. <laughs> Once I moved into an apartment pursuing these graduate degrees where raccoons lived in the ceiling above my head. <laughs> and one hot afternoon after coming back from the library in August, they came tumbling down out of the sky and into the apartment, screeching and running about. One of them took residence in the coat rack at the door. And you, <laughs> this was terrible, it was like an eight hour fair. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. And you might have to do as I did, call for help. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say neighbor to your right, I need help. <laughs> Despite the raccoons falling out of the sky and the loneliness and the discomfort, we must persist. We must hold on. Turn to your neighbor to your right or to your left and say, neighbor, neighbor. Hold, on. hold on. I remember as a boy, whenever I was expressing some discomfort with studying or persisting in some difficulty, my mother would say to me, be not weary in well-doing. It used to annoy me <laughs> to no end. But she was trying to prepare me for the discomfort of walking in my mission. She was trying to prepare me for when I would disappoint her and that disappointment necessary. If I were to be the poet I was called to be, you have to understand I was not raised to be a poet. <laughs> I was raised to be an engineer and a lawyer and then a minister. <laughs> I am none of those things. <laughs> but I am probably at the happiest I could be. And I had to disappoint my mother. And many, many years later, Many years later, I was in my 30s, after dropping out of college and pushing carts for a while and working in a Kroger and working at the TGI Fridays and putting my way through school, where she said, I didn't see it. I didn't see what you wanted to be, but you saw what you needed to be at 20. And I was 35. It takes that, y'all. Sometimes we have to walk. Right, beyond, we have to step out beyond the sort of foundation. Again, we're in another letter of Paul. This time, it's a letter to those in the region of Galatia. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm with a bunch of scholars that know how to say words like that. You know, I was raised in the Pentecostal church. We just approximated things sometimes. <laughs> the full verse says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Sometimes we're in a season of sowing rather than reaping. A season of toil rather than a season of comfort. We sometimes look at harvest time, the season of looking out onto a full field of corn as the easy season. But that is, that's also a season of work as well. The corn just doesn't hop into the barn. Someone must go out and harvest it. But what if the season we are entering is a season far off from the harvest? What if we're in the season of confusion, season of disaster, of catastrophe? I think about the summer of 2020, the summer of 68, the summer of 1898 here in America. For black folks, we are often in seasons of toiling. And we must do as my mother says, be not weary in well-doing. We must fight for the lives we know we deserve. But how? How do we maintain the desire to go on? I think it's not in delaying our joy until the end, not waiting for the season of toil or confusion of difficulty to be over. It's in claiming the joy, even ecstasy, 
in the middle of what may be catastrophe. It's in opening up moments of pleasure while the disaster may be beating a path toward our very heads. I think about the evenings and nights before the march on Washington, the nights before the march at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the nights before marches in Birmingham, Selma, and Montgomery. Black folks and their allies who were going to link arms and walk into the dogs and water cannons and police batons gathered in churches the night before. They gathered in fields. They gathered wherever they could, and they sung songs that would buoy up their spirits in the face of oncoming onslaught of the counter-revolution in the form of the police. They understood if they were going to face terror, they must have something inside them that would sustain them in the face of it, that would allow them to be not weary in well-doing. Turn to your neighbor. And say, neighbor, neighbor. Be, not weary be not weary and well-doing. Neighbor, we might have to toil for a while. We might have to sit in discomfort in order to live out our mission. Too often, I'm guilty of wanting the well-doing to yield its fruit right away. I'm looking up at the universe like, you see me down here doing what you tasked me to do. But I forget and am reminding myself now that a seed planted doesn't burst through the soil easily. The dirt above it doesn't just say, excuse me, yes, go ahead. Let me move out of your way. The seed must press its young head against the obstacle of the soil, the very thing it needs to survive, in order to gain access to another resource it needs to survive, the sun. It might sound like a contradiction, but sometimes the soil the thing you're planted in, something necessary for your growth and life, might seem like an obstacle, but it is not. The soil is doing what it is supposed to be doing, preparing you for your life. The soil is not against you, but is working toward your wellness. It is providing you with one of your first lessons of what it means to survive in a world of possible drought, possible struggle. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. sometimes you have to push. <laughs> and the pushing won't feel good. <laughs> but remember, be not weary and well-doing. Well All right, now I'm going I'm to take over again, y'all. Now, you might think I'm having you turn to your neighbor as part of some rhetorical flourish, or what one, one scholar said is, uh, happens in the African-American essayistic tradition, which is the will to adorn. But it's more than some appeal to pathos. If we look at these letters that Paul was sending to these new communities of Christians all over the world, Paul was extending his hand to his neighbor, to his Christian brethren and sister. He understood that in being weary, that that work could not be done in isolation. That weariness often strikes us most when we are in isolation. So Paul was reaching out beyond geographical limitations to create intimacy. And we might need to do that too. Dear graduates, remember that this community you've built here does not disappear because you've exited the doors as students. Remember, you've also entered another door, that as alumni. As the amateur philologist that I am, and in preparation for this lay sermon, I looked up the etymology of the term alumni. Its root is Latin. It comes from alare, which means to nourish. Often we think of that nourishing occurring in one direction as alumni, through philanthropy, gift giving, or mentoring those coming after us, and that is true. We are to lift as we climb. However, we also must remember that the Latin form of alumnus means foster son, ward, pupil. You are forever students of the Seminary of Southwest, forever pupils, wards of this college, forever in conversation with your professors, teachers, and mentors. And the school is here to nurture you. It's here to be with you and as a resource, even as you go out in the world. So, I always remind graduates, don't, you can call me. 
right? Even after you graduate, call me, send me an email, let's have coffee. Right, our bond doesn't end on graduation day. We are collaborators, co-conspirators now, and we have a duty to each other, and that duty is to nurture each other, to be each other's best thing. Dear graduates of the Seminary of the Southwest, go be someone's best thing. Thank you.